Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Savard. I'm the director of the New Hampshire Coalition to End Homelessness, and we have a full house, and that is something to be pretty proud of. I am excited to see everybody here who is passionate about something that I am passionate about, um, and it takes everybody in this room and then some to make a difference around housing stability and homelessness. So welcome to our first and hopefully not last summit. All right, so a couple quick uh, things to get us started. Um, I first want to recognize the partners in this summit, um, the Community Development Finance Authority and the New Hampshire Council on Housing Stability uh, really sat with the coalition to say, we gotta get people together. And so it really took the three partners to make this happen and I really appreciate all of their support along the way um, to bring a great summit to all of you. Um, no summit this size is possible without an all hands on deck approach. And I'd really like to thank those colleagues who really made this happen along the way. Um, they got voluntold to join this committee. <laughs> um, and suddenly showed up and they're like, what are we doing? I'm like, you're helping me plan a summit, thanks. <laughs> um, so I really have to thank them. So Todd Marsh, Bob Mack, Kirsten Barton, Melissa Latham, and Betsy Benito, thank you for all of your Zoom calls to make this happen. Um, a really special thank you. Oops, yes, thank you. They're out there working hard, but I got to give a shout out to um, two people who really did all the details. Um, Carolyn Conlon of Pair Associates and Julie De Silva, the program coordinator of the New Hampshire Coalition to End Homelessness. They're out there working hard trying to find you all seats. So uh, thank you for supporting them and all this work. And I thank them for everything they did. They, they definitely hid the hiccups along the way, so if you don't see them, they did a great job, right? <laughs> um, I want to thank all of the presenters, moderators, panelists, and facilitators. It took a lot of people to make sure that I wasn't the one talking to you all day, so you're all going to appreciate that. Um, and I want to thank all of them for doing so. Um, let's see. A couple quick logistics. So we put this in the program in the email that folks should have received on Friday. Um, but we want to thank Concord TV. They're here recording the event. It's not live, so don't panic. Um, <laughs> but it is being recorded. And so they will play it on Concord TV um, in the near future. And we're recording it so that folks who couldn't make it today, we're going to find ways for them to have access to it. Um, and we'll keep folks posted so you can spread the word when that happens. Um, they may also be sending it out to other public TVs, so maybe you'll see it um, in your region at some point as well. Um, we also wanted to say that um, by the end of today or early tomorrow, you'll receive a survey monkey asking for feedback on the summit. Please don't be shy. Please take the time to fill it out. We have to know what we need to do to make it better. Um, so give us the feedback along the way so that we are aware of it. Uh, we know some folks ended up in region tables that you're like, why am I sitting at this region? If you said you were statewide, we had to put you somewhere, um, and we want you to have a conversation at a region. Where you're sitting right now and during lunch is less the issue. The afternoon, we'll be having conversations by regions. Some regions are a little small but mighty, so you got put together um, to be able to have those conversations together. All right, uh, social media. I need you to, you know, it, for those who do it, <laughs> I need you to use social media. Blast about the summit. On your table tents are some of the hashtags that we're hoping that you can use. Please post, spread the word that we're all here doing good work um, so we can let folks know um, that there is a group of people that are serious about this issue and want to make change. So help me spread the word um, by doing some social media today throughout the day. All right, so we're going to start the program. Um, and I would like to first invite our first presenter. Let me get my stuff in front of me here. Um, to represent the New Hampshire Council on Housing Stability, uh, Chris Stantonello is the co-chair. Um, she is the assistant, assistant commissioner, nope, associate commissioner um, at the Department of Health and Human Services. She was first appointed on June of 2021 and reappointed this October. Chris has broad policy and operational roles within the department and directly provides leadership to both the Division of Economic and Housing Stability and the Division of Long-Term Supports and Services. Chris, come on up. Uh, 
Okay, so is this a microphone? Or is this one? I don't know. There's two of them here. This is way too much technology after all these uh, last three years of Zoom and everything, right? So, so first of all, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. This is just such an amazing um, event, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, I think one of the things we really want to spend time today doing is really talk with one another, learn from one another in an effort to come up with solutions for those who are housing insecure <coughs> and those experiencing homelessness in our local communities and within our state. As many of you are aware, housing insecurity and homelessness is complex. There is not one solution and it takes all of us working together to make homelessness, homelessness rare, brief, and one time. Where's Betsy, remember that? Um, we have been and continue to face challenging times. The pandemic, the increase in people experiencing homelessness, the rising cost of many things, fuel, electricity, food, housing, the lack of housing, these all have and will continue to be pressure points for many of us in this room as we work together to find solutions. I have the pleasure to serve as a co-lead for New Hampshire's House Council on Housing Stability. I serve along with Katie Easterly Marte of CDFA and Taylor Caswell of the Department of Business and Economic Affairs. The council was created on November 18th, 2020 under executive order by Governor Sununu. This replaced the Council on Homelessness. When the council was created, the council had less than one month to convene and provide the governor with a preliminary plan. We did it, and we did it well, even with a holiday in the middle. We actually finished early, but I wouldn't let us turn it in because I didn't want to have the bar <laughs> raised really high. Um, and I think this early success of the council, bringing diverse people, interests, skills, and knowledge was a strong foundation for which to build upon. What makes this council different is we are charged with creating a plan to create housing stability for all citizens of New Hampshire, not just for those experiencing homelessness. We are also charged with coordinating a governance structure across state government and connecting with local communities by co conducting regular needs assessments and strategic planning. And yes, updating the state's plan on supporting those experiencing homelessness in the state of New Hampshire. In June of 2021, the council unanimously, unanimously submitted a three-year strategic plan with the goals of increased housing availability is critical for New Hampshire's future and to update the state's plan on homelessness so that it is rare, brief, and one time. With these overarching goals, we created a three-year plan. I'm not going to go through all of the details of the plan. You can go to our website for all that information. I will highlight some of what we have been focusing on that sets the foundation for our continued work. A bipartisan housing caucus has been formed in the legislature with the goal of informing fellow lawmakers about ways to increase housing availability and stability in the state. There's been increased coordination among the three continuum of cares within our state, and that really impacts the individuals we're trying to serve. Legislation was passed to extend a time a tenant has to cure <coughs> his or her non-payment. We are conducting community mapping and a training program to identify how people move through the system. We're working really closely with all of the welfare directors through the Municipal Welfare Association. We're collaborating directly and in a more formalized manner with homeless service providers in a number of communities across the state. We're on track to have, house, have zoning barriers that impede mixed use and or residential development removed in 10 communities by 2023. And we are able to work to ensure that the Invest New Hampshire priorities included financial support for those local communities that make regulatory changes that promote affordable housing development. The Balance of State and the Manchester Continuum of Cares received youth demonstration grants for youth experiencing homelessness. They are working together on implementation. And finally, 
we were able to pilot incentives for landlords to increase rental opportunities for those to access housing vouchers. 102 units opened up under this pilot. The Department of Health and Human Services continues to work to meet demand. We are excited to share that through the governor's office, um, in recognition of how hard this winter may be, we were awarded an additional $5 million. Five million, four million will go to assist, assist existing shelters who are under contract with the department. And then we also have $1 million for communities to assist with winter needs. Not to supplant, but to support local community efforts. As the balance of state collaborative applicant, the department also submitted an application for the 2022 Continuum of Care Supplemental Notice of Funding. Big words, right? Um, and it's really to address unsheltered and rural homelessness. This was created um, as a special application to really focus on those who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Melissa, Mandy, um, Heidi, I don't know if Christy's there, other members of our team, and I'm sure um, they can talk to you a little bit more later today. I have to say I am humbled to see you all here working together to make things better for our community and our state. While I am proud and grateful for all we have done and the opportunity to work with such a diverse, talented, and committed group of people, we have lots to still do. We can only be successful working together for there is no greater state than the state of New Hampshire. To quote American anthropologist Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. OK, so the rest of our morning session um, is really about taking the opportunity to hear some of the unique solutions to addressing homelessness that are already happening across the state. They're either happening or they're emergency, emerging practices that we need to be proud of, we need to talk about, and we need to think about how that model might be able to work in our region. So we want to take the time to have individual panelists come up to talk about some of the three topics that we thought were really important to have conversations about and that we should be proud of these models that have already started to address them in their community. So the topics we're going to look at are, especially at this time of year, I know this is sort of the top of our minds, community approaches to winter sheltering in New Hampshire. Um, that is going to be our first one. And so if I can ask uh, the panelists to come up and have a seat, and then I'll introduce the moderator, if you want to make your way on up um, to the tables here. Um, when we wanted to bring in a moderator, we really need to always make sure that uh, this person can engage conversation and help engage the audience. And so uh, we turn to Todd Marsh, who is the welfare director with the city of Rochester and uh, president of the New Hampshire Local Welfare Administrators Association, who, if you know Todd, has some pretty boundless energy um, and is always ready for some collaboration and innovation. So Todd, come on up as your panelists make their way. Um, and both uh, <laughs> Manchester and Seacoast panelists can come on up um, and just share some seats. So 1269, Hope, who else we got up here? The mayors. All right, Todd, you have everything Thank you me. need? Boundless energy. Okay. <laughs> before or after my coffee. Yeah. Um, first, I want to say um, that I'm excited to be here. And really, I think you know, standing here, I can really sincerely feel you know, the passion that you have for our cause, the compassion that you have for the people that we seek to help and uh, the dedication that you all have for continuous improvement and to help make the lives of the people that we're seeking to help better. 
So thank you for that. And I really want you to give each other a hand for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so before I introduce the panelists, I just want to share a short story, <laughs> short story, just to put things into context here. Um, so about five plus years ago, maybe five to 10, I'm not sure. It all morphs together sometimes. So it was about 10 a.m. I was in my office and uh, the news headlines talked about extreme cold hitting the region in the state. And so I was on the phone with my peers um, in Dover and Summersworth asking about uh, what their efforts would be um, for at least a warming center during the daytime because we hadn't had anything else beyond that in our area. Um, I was on the phone with them. I was on the phone with the My Friends Place Shelter in Dover asking them, can you take anyone tonight? Can you take just one extra person tonight? And they said they, they would do what they could, um, and, but they knew it wouldn't be enough. I was on the phone with Crossroads Shelter in Portsmouth. And as Crossroads will normally say to me, which I very much appreciate, they said, Todd, we'll take as many as we can in that type of situation. So long as we still meet fire code. We'll squeeze as many people as we can. We won't turn people away if we can help it. And so with that knowledge, I communicated with Dover and Summersworth, but we all still knew, as Portsmouth State stated, Crossroads, they knew it still would not be enough. And so fast forward. Around 2.30, maybe quarter of three, I received a call from my city manager, who is directly above me, structurally and in the building. And he stated, Todd, I need you in my office. That's how we talked. Uh, I said, okay. I went up there. <coughs> I'm, in, I'm there, he's there, um, the uh, chief of fire is there, and the director of public buildings is there. And they were talking about, they, they were already in, in, in the midst of a conversation, uh, and they were talking about keeping some sort of warming center type situation open until about nine o'clock in the community center, which was longer than we normally would have had it. And you know, the benefit of having someone from social services within town city halls, right, was for a social service person to look at it from a different perspective. And when the city manager said, so are we all set? I was the one who raised my hand as social services and I stated, okay, well, who's going to be that volunteer? Who's going to be that city employee who's going to say, you need to leave at nine o'clock, right? And the city manager stopped for a moment, paused, and to his credit, now, whether it was out of compassion or, um, you know, um, negative press, whatever it was, I don't care. M maybe a combination, I'll take it. He stated, all right, we're gonna keep it open tonight. We're gonna keep it open, and I don't care what the community center thinks about it. <laughs> we're gonna keep it open, let's make it happen, all right? So from my perspective, that was not the beginning of Relation, rela good relationships between the Tri-Cities, but an example, but an example of what can be done. That stood out in my mind. And within an hour, I was um, part of the email chain between c the city manager and other city managers and mayors. And within an hour, both Summersworth and Dover almost simultaneously reached back to, to Rochester stating, what can we do? What can we do to help? And that was the beginning. And so I just wanted to set that up to put further efforts in context. That said, I want to introduce, well, I'm not seeing, okay, Mayor Hilliard, nice <laughs> to see you, okay. Um, Mayor Dana Hilliard uh, is serving his fifth term as mayor of the Hilltop City, a graduate of Summersworth High School. He attended Keene State College, earning a bachelor's degree in political science in Plymouth State University with a master's degree in educational leadership entering elected public service when he was 20. He served five terms in the New Hampshire House and also serves, uh, served two terms on the city council representing Ward 4. My ward, by the way. 
Uh, he has served on numerous city committees, boards, and uh, commissions since high school. I also want to be transparent. Mary Hilliard is also my childhood um, neighbor, friend. So at, a, at the age of 10, we were talking about how we were going to change the world. I know what you're thinking. You guys sound super cool. We would, <laughs> we would have loved to have known you and hung out with you. We didn't have Atari, uh, so that's what we had to do. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mayor Carrier. Uh, Mayor Carrier from the city of Dover. Mayor Carrier is a lifelong resident of the city of, in Do of Dover. He attended uh, Dover schools and graduated from Plymouth University with a degree in business. He has served on many boards and commissions in the city and has been on the city council for 14 years. He has been a self-employed contractor for over 40 years. Welcome, Mayor Carrier. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Paul Callahan. Mayor Paul Callahan is serving in his first term as mayor of the city of Rochester, uh, the city that I work. Uh, he has served for the Stratford County uh, Sheriff's Office for 25 years, most recently as the lieutenant and prosecutor. His service also includes the board of directors for the Main Street Committee uh, and the Rochester Planning Board and the Technical Review Committee. He holds a master's degree of public administration and from the, uni from the University of New Hampshire. Welcome, Mayor Callahan. Thank you. And I also want to introduce members representing efforts in the Manchester area. Uh, let's see here. We have Keith Howard. Uh, Keith Howard is the executive director of the Manchester's Hope for the New Hampshire Recovery and, and in 2021 worked with the 20, uh, 1269 Cafe to create and operate a winter warming station. Howard has experienced homelessness himself and, is openly, and openly shares that he is a person in recovery. He is a U.S. Army veteran and attended the University of New Hampshire in uh, Cordon Connell Theological Seminary. He holds a master's degree from the uh, Riviere College and is a member of the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs and chairperson of the New Hampshire Recovery Monument Commission. Welcome, Keith. Okay, and we also have uh, Mary Chevalier. Is that correct? No. No. Chevalier. Chevalier. Thank you. <laughs> See? Well, I asked, all right? Uh, Mary Chevalier. Uh, co-founder of 1269 Cafe, more recently known as the 12 on Union, with her husband Craig in 2009, in a little storefront at 1269 Elm Street, she was, she will tell you that she's a civilian who fell into uh, uh, ministry to the homeless uh, in the poor of Manchester, and couldn't imagine life without it. In her previous life, she worked in human resources at Riverbend Community Mental Health, and prior to that, she was human resources database administrator for a large insurer in Worcester, Mass. She and Craig are small business owners in addition to their hands-on work at 1269. Mary Chevalier, welcome. Thank you. We also have, is it Brian? Bryn. Bryn, okay. Bryn uh, McCurry Bauer. Bryn. Uh, is the site manager of 1269 Cafe, a.k.a. The Twelve. She met the founders of 1269 Cafe in 2017 while in the process of rebuilding her life. A survivor of homelessness and addiction herself, she found an immediate connection with them and was drawn to their ministry at 1269. Bryn officially joined the team in 2019 and is the first full-time staff member of The Twelve. She is passionate about her work, and uniquely qualified to serve the vulnerable population, or this vulnerable population. She is now an integral part of the 1269 family and continues to search for ways to serve better and do more. Bryn, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so bef before we begin, uh, again, I will say that, you know, since I am very familiar with Mayor Hilliard, we have a history together, and um, that uh, Mayor Callahan is the Rochester mayor, which I work. Um, mayor Carrier, you're going to be getting all the hard pressing questions, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks. All right. So, 
Um, to begin, uh, what we want to do is start out um, with the Tri-City area. And um, whoever wants to answer this question or a combination, it's up, it's up to you guys. Um, you have 15 minutes. If you could describe um, your um, winter warming efforts. Um, and also, I would appreciate it if you could mention um, the master plan efforts, um, the collaborative ma Tri-City master plan efforts that led up to, the, to winter warming. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, great. I'm a, I've had 23 years in public education, so I'm used to my voice going from the top floor to the bottom floor at any given time within the school, and everyone from every corner being able to hear me. So it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, my two colleagues here drove in together. I had some responsibilities in the morning, so they said I drew the small straw not yeah, being in the car that I get to talk to the Tri-City Mayor. So I guess that's fair enough. Uh, the, efforts, the efforts date back about four years ago when the Tri-City area decided we would try this new thing in public, elected public service. Some of you might have heard about it. It's kind of catchy, it's called civility and communication. And these brand new concepts actually, when you apply them, work. And you can make gains. And it literally started within a coffee shop one morning when we continue to experience um, high rates of homelessness within the Tri-City area. Like most of you hitting your head against the wall going, what are we going to do? and decided we need to get together and decide what we can do as government. Knowing that government cannot solve every single problem, and nor should it, but it should lead. It should lead within the partnership of connecting business, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, all together simultaneously going in the same direction to come up with short-term solutions and long-term standing solutions. So over a couple cups of coffee, what emerged that morning was coming up with the Tri-City um, Coalition for Homelessness, whose duty would be, and it was the mayor's coalition, we went down the same direction, immediately appointing a coalition made up of all of those organizations that I just spoke about, whose job would be to come up with a master plan. And to dig deep over the next year, look at every aspect of what the Tri-City area could do together, come up with a master plan, and then the three mayors would then have to go on the road show and get all three city councils to agree to it. All three city councils to move in the same direction simultaneously at the same time so that together we could address this problem. And we did. We worked for a year tirelessly, us sitting back, letting those organizations and all those sectors take control, letting them lead, and us simply being there for resources us being there to lean on and to support, knowing that our job was going to be to sell it to the three councils. All three councils unanimously approved of it. And then came COVID. Because our plan at that time was we were getting bailed out by a lot of the nonprofits, and I mean bailed out, and the faith-based organizations. Is that we were utilizing the city coffers to support that, and a lot of the churches was really our emergency plan of suddenly when bad weather rolled in. And then suddenly those, those doors got shut. And rightfully so. And all of us were left standing going, what are we going to do next? Knowing that that was part of our plan was to come up with an, an emergency warming center for the Tri-City area. And again, following the plan that we adopted with fidelity. Knowing that we had to simultaneously, all three cities, move in the same direction while working hand in hand with the nonprofits, with the faith-based organizations, with businesses, with our zoning and planning boards, which we continue to do for affordable housing, how are we going to now fill this hole? So literally on a Friday night, Bob called me, because I was in the car and said, we got an opportunity for some state money that just came down the pipe. And Dover's willing to lead at purchasing a warming center. So I was ecstatic, I said, this is great, great news, Bob. Sign me up, Summersworth will be in. He's like, great, because the property we want to purchase is in Summersworth. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Rochester was ecstatic. <laughs> so both of them were pushing hard, going, we'll get the money, you sell it to your city council. Well, the property was there. Again, all three of us agreed in the beginning when we started this journey that we would stick together. And that the only way that we were going to make gains is sticking together and not dividing and conquering. So, I had the pleasure of going before my city council and saying that we have this great opportunity to capture some money, to open a warming center, 
and it will have to lie within our city borders, of which unanimously the council agreed. Again, so the direction, the direction then started. Knowing that our plan was that this was a temporary fix, right? That this was going to bail us out for a year. Of course, we were all optimistic that COVID would go away a year later. <laughs> That we would take the lead and then that we would put the property up for sale a year later, utilize those funds working hand in hand again with nonprofit and business sectors, and look for a permanent, uh, permanent shelter. Uh, well, as we know, COVID didn't go away. So I had the pleasure again and agreed that I would go back before the city council and say, just kidding. We need one more year. Uh, of which the Summersworth City Council once again agreed that we would move forward again, with this warming center located within Summersworth. Uh, the story then kind of manifested a little. The following year, we changed directions from an emergency warming center to a full-time, 24 hours, seven days a week operational center, um, and tried that out. And we fell on our face disastrously. It did not work within the community. We did not have the resources. We learned our hard lessons. Not only did we learn our hard lesson that we were not equipped for that, um, there was a tremendous drain on the Summersworth first responders. Um, the city started growing weary of the master plan that we adopted and some of the big stakeholders that we had all on board started breaking off a little. So we had to have a hard conversation on what we were going to do. Uh, that's when we actually pulled in the county and started having a large conversation with our county government saying, Look, the three cities within, within, the tri within Stratford County, the only three cities within Stratford County have led. We know that homelessness has no borders and nor does addiction. The towns and the whole county now need to lead in the same direction that Dover, Summersworth, and Rochester has. And let's start having these hard conversations of, of what we can do. Over the course of the last year, we developed what we call the three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool would be that we would build a brand new nursing home within uh, Stratford County, that the old nursing home would then be converted into a homeless transitional shelter, and that all three areas, Summersworth, Dover, and Rochester, would continue to lead on zoning and planning following our master plan. So that plan is still within development. We've gone to the county delegation, still trying to push that plan through. We're a little stalled right now. Uh, but we, will, we are hopeful that within the end that this three-legged stool will come to fruition. In the interim, our warning center is open again, will be open this season. Um, Summersworth has agreed that if this plan gets adopted by the county, that we will pony up and that we will continue to operate the warming center until this plan comes to the end in fruition. I went to the city council asking for one more year, again, uh, and they in turn said if this plan passes, we're in for the long haul because we know it's going to take time to build the new nursing home. We know it's going to take time to convert. So this will be some as worst part. Again, of leading that we will continue to operate this extreme warming center while the plan goes forward. So we'll see in the end if this plan does get developed. Obviously, us three mayors and the county commissioners are, are committed to this. Again, this is what can happen when we erase those superficial lines. We have the benefit that our three councils are nonpartisan. We don't care what side of the aisle you sit on. We don't as mayors. What we care about is coming up with solutions and actually helping people. <clears throat> is how do we lead all three cities in the same direction with problems that have no borders? And this has been a catalyst of us being able to work together on larger things. All three of us have unique histories. All three of us have unique problems. All three of us have solid identities. Trust me, you're a hilltopper. The last thing you want to be called is a red raider. <laughs> Change your mascot. Um, <laughs> but we, all three of us work together. All three of us work together. And erasing those superficial lines has led to us being able to, again, adopt their master plan where all three cities are on the same page. Where all three councils now work together going the simultaneously direction trying to solve something that is so much bigger than us. So much bigger than us. And all of us in that room, all of us in this room know that. But this is what can happen again when you communicate. When you come up with a vision that literally starts in a coffee shop and you decide that we don't have any choices. 
but to start making incremental gains step by step by step. How did you guys, all right? Hey, all right. you summed it up. There we go. Thank you, Mary Hilliard. Um, I feel like we're sitting on the curb next to our houses again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> any this right. Um, you know, and I think. I think Bob wants to stop it. Oh, go ahead. Well, absolutely. One thing yeah. that I wanted to say. Thank you all for coming today. This is important. We have also what we call the Mayor's Roundtable. Some of you are familiar with that. So there's 13 mayors in the state, in the largest cities that uh, uh, get on a Zoom meeting every month, and we exchange ideas. And that's what this is about and to try to extract what some communities are doing that we don't know about. So if you turn back the clock a little bit in the city of Dover, and I've been there all my life, um, which is what, 21 years? No. <laughs> um, back along, they used to have a lot of homes, a lot of buildings uh, that was rooming houses. And we could support at least 200, 250 people that would go to their room, they'd have a shared bathroom, but they'd get up in the morning and they'd go to work, and then on Friday they would pay their bill, and maybe it was $30, maybe it was 40 and it worked. It certainly worked. And progressively, as time went on, the economy got better, and buildings got torn down, bigger buildings got built, and so we didn't have those resources anymore. So now, everything that Dana has said, Maya Hilliard said, uh, it, it's fantastic, and now we're also looking at zoning. So if some zoning can be changed, that some of us out there can say, geez, I've got an extra space in my house, is that allowed? Yes, and we're, they're all good people up here, they need help, you know? And I know there's drug addiction, there's mental health, and there are services up there that are beyond belief helping people that a lot of people don't realize. I mean, you can name them, there's a, there's a whole list. So, you know, I just want to leave to say that uh, the three of us are continuing as a tri-city venture to work on this situation and try to make things better. And so far, I believe we have. Uh, sometimes council is a, council's a tough to explain everything we are doing or want to do because they haven't seen it totally in front of them. But, you know, we have a lot of history in the last, say, five, six years. And so that's uh, what I'll leave you with. But, you know, I think it's a, it's a great uh, gathering today. So, All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about that we're addressing, and um, you heard Dana mention it with the uh, nursing home. I don't have to tell anyone in this room that um, our elderly, have at least 25% to almost 30% of all the rental units that stay there. A lot of them are on fixed income. A lot of them are staying in these apartments a lot longer than they should because they don't want to go to a nursing home. So we're, we're concerned with that age demographic also. And uh, as we touched on some of our uh, zoning changes, we're really looking at some zero density in our area where we can have mixed use of affordable housing and fix income for the album. Seconds? All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> what a great example. What a great example of a multi pronged approach to a multi faceted challenge. Right? And as was indicated, you know, government isn't the only solution. Um, but I, I, I have noticed a definite increase in uh, collaboration and efforts. Um, in Rochester, we just recently hired a, um, a community outreach facilitator, an outreach worker, for our local welfare department. That is very, very unique and very unusual. And I appreciate the city of Rochester, including Mayor Callahan's efforts with that. In Dover, um, social worker right, out of the police department. And in not just Rochester and Dover, but all across the state, I'm seeing those upstepped efforts. Again, government's not the only solution, but it's certainly one of the prongs. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, I want to mention that what a great example of a inside-out approach, of an inside-out approach, of 
of government taking the lead. Taking the lead, but also working with the professionals, reaching out to the professionals, reaching out to experts. And I think, again, that is something that's unusual and it's something that's increasing. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to um, the Manchester area, who is taking more of a outside-in approach, which is also appreciated, um, which is not void of working with government as well. So um, Manchester, Opportunity Knox. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes, you can say Knox for So, um, yeah, that was a really good description of what I would see as a top-down plan, where the leaders of three communities got together, laid out a plan working with professionals. What 1269 and COVID done is much more a grassroots, much more, thank you, much more a grassroots, is this going through the microphone? Okay. Is that any better? Uh, no. Okay, well then, I'm not going to speak to that. I'm going to speak to you. Now it's on. Okay. So, Stephanie, can you now hear me? I got you. Okay. Everybody can hear. Okay, let me begin again. Okay. So, what. a smaller goal. We wanted to keep anybody from dying in Manchester last year because of the cold. That was our goal. We didn't have a larger transformative mission, although the world needs larger transformative missions. Um, Mary, Bryn, I, and all the people at Hope and 1269 just wanted to make sure that no one would die. And we did manage to do that. Um, and so I think it's important that there be both government intervention, but I also think there's a place for two small nonprofits to band together to save lives. And this all came about um, just a little bit less than a year ago. At Hope, I was approached by um, a government official who talked about perhaps having $40,000 to start up a warming station. Um, and so, although Hope is a recovery center focused on helping people um, strengthen their recovery from drug and alcohol issues, a lot of our membership is formerly homeless, as was mentioned during the introduction. I'm formerly homeless, and the two issues are pretty um, intricately entwined. Um, so we, we're located in a building that also houses a transitional living facility unrelated to us. So we talked with the folks that ran that facility Enough, they were not as excited about having a homeless warming station on the first floor of their building um, as we had hoped. But it, no, it honestly is very understandable. They've got a fragile population. So then we reached out to 1269, um, which runs a homeless services program, uh, Christian based and talked about citing something there. Then lo and behold, the $40,000 that had gotten this conversation going um, melted away. I don't know what happened. So I went to the Hope Board of Directors and said, we don't want to see people die this winter. We're projecting a budget of about $100,000 we're going to need to do a lot of fundraising, but I'm asking you as the board of directors to take on financial responsibility for whatever we can't raise. And 
bless their souls, they all agreed that keeping people alive was um, part of our larger mission. And we're gonna talk now, uh, actually I'm gonna let other, I'm gonna shut up and let other people speak. Um, but we managed to work with 1269 with a staff made up of HOPE members, not HOPE staff members, but people that come to HOPE for services, plus folks from 1269. Um, all of the staff had experienced homelessness, in the, homelessness themselves. Almost all were in recovery themselves, so that it was a truly peer-based, eyeball-to-eyeball experience. There was, other than control of the bathroom, there was little power differential. It was much more a paid staff having a chance to say to people who are experiencing homelessness, I was sitting in your seat six months ago, six weeks ago, a year ago, and I tell you, it's possible to get out of that seat. That is so much more powerful than having, and nothing against social workers, but having a social worker come and do motivational interviewing to have somebody say, I was where you are, give me your hand, and I'll help guide you out. So now I'm going to sit back and be as quiet as I can and let these guys speak.
change as we went along. Um, you know, once an hour was a good was a good time for everybody who would be there. Um, but it was lots of uh, lots of good things going on there, but always just for the safety of the officers and others. Right? So we were doing some wonderful work up at the Ortiz, but we really didn't try to do the same thing as Justin Tibble, who was getting um, a good number of bathrooms. You know, two bathrooms. Uh, you can install the urinals and ask for eight.
speak, I will, I will add that um, during the process, uh, city welfare, I know the, the three city welfare managers um, were um, part of the conversation, and I know all three of us appreciate being part of that. Again, it, it's an example of being, um, having a social service um, person in the room. Um, and I appreciate Katie from Dover, who great candy from Dover. I know I'm not sure if Kristen's here from Sunnyport. Um, uh, but we appreciate, um, you know, sometimes just sort of being that social service whisperer in the, uh, in the city manager's ears and staying away from the politics part. Although my mind tends to go there sometimes, uh, but I stay away from that part. Um, so thank you. Uh, to the Manchester area, uh, what type of community supports were available in your model? Are you adding any new community supports this year? For our first year, we did not ask for nor receive any government funding at all. We raised every penny from private citizens. And then the city of Manchester, uh, to its credit, recognized the success of what we have done, and they have now added us significantly to their budget. Mary?
raises an eye with a master plan because the last, I, I've gone through too many cycles, we, all of us do, we come up with this beautiful little document, it goes into the shiny little line, everyone gets a copy, and then it goes on the shelf. And then everyone forgets about it. So the first thing out of our mouth is that this will be a breathing document, and that all three will continue to remind this council and refer back to it, as we do with every step regarding everything with this master plan, is that when one of our councils tends to go in a different direction, one of the mayors then bats him back in order and says, oh, well, we have a master plan for that that you agreed to. And that we are going to go in this direction because all three councils agreed to it. And that any time we come up with an initiative, we want to make sure that it is aligned with the master plan. So that was part of it, was all three of us agreeing that we are going to be the taskmasters to continue to remind the Tri-City area that we agreed to this document, this document is living and breathing and that it needs to be, if we're going to be able to do our part out of this, this small little chunk that we can accomplish out of this massive social issue that we're tackling. Yeah, just, just quickly, I, I think of the important part for us that the addition to the after the master plan was getting the uh, county on board and it really has taken off to the uh, next level with that. And as Dan has said, I'm mm -hmm. a uh, broken record now, consistency, we go by this master plan and it makes it a lot easier when we deal with our council. And quickly, I just think, uh, as far as the Dover City Council, uh, one of the hurdles I feel that I had was that we brought forth a plan and there were, oh, you opened it up for questions and a lot of questions. They wanted more information. What exactly are you going to do tomorrow? What exactly are you going to do in a week? And I'm sorry. We are, we're not sure. This is something that we have multiple meetings with the city managers, the welfare directors, the planning board, right down the line, and it, it, it's always working. It's always moving forward. But specifically, that was one of the hard things. It's like, I want to know exactly before I decide yes on this, what are you going to do? I'm sorry. You know, this is the plan. This is what we plan to do. But, you know, up until we come to you again with the specifics, I can't give you any more information. So then, you know, I believe they, they, they trust us. I think that's the biggest thing. They trust what we're doing. And when they listen to myself or the city manager, open the doors, talk about what we've done, they say, okay, you know, we're going to put our trust in it. I know they're working hard. And uh, so people that come up to the podium, they can get a little tough. <laughs> But that's okay. We open with totally transparent. So I'm hearing there were some challenges. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, that was the question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm going to add that um, I was on I was on the task force, um, actually representing Summit Works, but working in Dover. And I'd like to say that I ate lunch in Dover. Excuse me, working in Rochester. <laughs> but so I, I I like to eat lunch in Dover. So it's sort of the tri factor. Um, despite me being on it, it was a success. Um, I think one of the brilliant strategies of that task force, of the decision, it was a decision to have an eclectic task force, made up not just of social worker thieves, right, but people representing the faith-based community, right, a certain amount of people, business, I believe, elected officials, right, so that they could all begin get insight from all over the area. Um, and it also helped clearly provide some ownership, including with the elected officials, to bring back to their councils. Uh, that wasn't lost on me, and uh, so I think that was, that was important. I will say it might have slowed it down a little bit, right, because of just knowledge going into it, but it was huge on the, on the, on the, um, at the end. So, very important. Um, Manchester, uh, were there any lessons learned out of intentionally hiring people in recovery? Do you have plans to adjust the staffing hiring model in any way? So, so far I've been very upbeat. Now, uh, I have to confess that of the staff that we hired last year, one recently died of an overdose. Another one is back into active addiction and living on the streets. A third has struggled with sobriety. Um, and I think one of the mistakes that we made unwittingly was not recognizing how powerful it was for folks to be working at the warming station 
passing on their knowledge. And then March 31st came, and it was all over. And people who had like not just been recognized, but had self-recognition that I'm important, I matter, I make a difference in the world, went right back to being, oh, okay, so I'm in recovery, but I don't really have a job, don't have any real identity, um, and so that is something we are struggling to keep from happening this year. The man that overdosed was one of my employees with whom I met um, three or four times weekly up until a week before his death, and he gave no signs that a reoccurrence or a relapse was on the way. And so I am, even though this was about two months ago, I am still very shattered inside by Pete's death. Um, and I want to make sure that we got through the winter last year with nobody dying of an overdose at the warming station. We got through the winter last year with nobody dying of exposure in the city of Manchester. But one of our own dead, and we own some portion of that, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Mary, did you want to bring? Yeah. I'll just add that that being said, um, you know, it's uh, incredibly sad, and we don't really know yet what we're going to do to make that difference for our staff this year, but we're, you know, committed going into um, working with them through the winter months help them sort of find their purpose. And a purpose isn't just a job, but for me and for many people in this long-term recovery, um, you know, having a purpose when you wake up every day is what keeps you going. So we're going to commit time to meeting with each of them and to work with them and see what they want to do after the warming station is over because March 31st um, we're done and we don't want them to be left to flounder at that time. Thank you. Explain um, why the shelter initiative um, is why, why we're calling it a warming center versus a winter shelter. Yeah, sure, because that, that's what it is. It only opens during extreme weather. Uh, it, it's a warming center. It's not a 24-hour shelter, um, and, and that is our part of it. Is that the Tri-City area is offering, <coughs> offering an extreme warming center? Uh, we are scheduled, you know, with, based on the bombers on the back. I'm just kidding. You know. <laughs> uh, we, we are expecting that we're going to have about 60 days of operation, uh, just kind of crystal balling this year, based upon weather. If, if we have to go more than that, then we're, we're budgeted to go more than that. Uh, but, but again, it's extreme weather with our emergency management directors uh, making that decision. All three, all three meet regularly determine uh, when the shelter is going to be open and for the period it is going to be open and it's driven in that direction. Uh, the only thing I'll add is that uh, if the shelter is not open on a particular day that has somewhat inclement weather, but not to the degree that they'll open, uh, there are facilities. Dover has the fire station, the police station, different areas they can go to. Rochester the same, some is worth the same. Nobody's going to be left out in the cold. Nobody. And they can go to welfare, and welfare does a tremendous job in uh, taking a look at where they can place some of these people temporarily or a little longer than that. So. In, our, um, in our building and grounds, have uh, put a little room together in the uh, front of the police department where he folks can go. Thank you. And as was indicated, I will indicate that um, News for Welfare um, will meet our legal obligations, as I indicate to all of our members. Not only our legal obligations, but the humanitarian intent behind those obligations. We would prefer a shelter environment which 
case management is available in other environments. Um, but you will absolutely do what we need to do to keep a roof over someone's head. Um, to Manchester, same question. Uh, what was the reasoning behind the decision to have a warming center versus a winter shelter model? Um, for us, it was really just simply an issue of capacity. Um, if we decided to go with sheltering, like we've done in the past, um, with uh, social distancing and all the other blessings of COVID, we would only be able to fit 16 people, and we knew that there were many more than 16 that needed a place to be. Um, so our capacity was 53, and we were able to flex that on especially cold nights and take up to know maybe 65 people and we had some space on another floor um, so we were just able to serve more people and throughout the winter we had 6,240 points of contact so and we wouldn't have been able to do that if we had gone to the sheltering model. Thank you. Uh, what would you do differently if you could do it again? That's recognizing that that the Tri-City region has built, a partnership that will certainly, part of our goal of building that partnership is that it will outlast all three of us. Uh, you know, I'm not the first mayor that suffers with that, I certainly won't be the last. So I mean, our, our goal was, again, to plow through the field and to allow the seeds to be planted, a growing a model that will outlast all three of us. And, and that model is continuing to strengthen each year. Uh, I'm proud of the piece of this puzzle, and again, it is a Government can deliver a piece to this 10,000 piece puzzle. That's it. We're not going to deliver 9,000 9, pieces of the 10,000 piece puzzle. Is that we have a piece in it and a role in it. And that every everyone that we can get to the table to deliver that other piece of the puzzle, we're finally getting the big picture. And, and that's really our role. Our role is to continue to support, continue to inspire, and continue to lead those partnerships of aligning everything together. Because we know that. The, the faith-based organizations and the nonprofits can't solve this all by themselves. Government can't solve this all by themselves. But building those partnerships, we're really able to get ahead. <coughs> Whatever getting ahead looks like, by the way. See, uh, Todd, I'm the rookie in this. I, I've got a year on, and Bob's got uh, about 10, and then Dan is a 10-plus year. But um, my first year has been phenomenal. The relationship that we've built with the uh, mayors and with the managers is fantastic, and I really like this next step that we're taking with the three-legged plan. Where we now have the county on board, we're gonna build a new nursing home, hopefully within the next three or four years, and use that old nursing home as a transitional housing facility where they'll have mental health and where they'll have substance abuse uh, assistance. I guess the only thing I could say is, uh, Everything is going somewhat as planned. Again, to reiterate the point, COVID hit, you know, and it really kind of set us back a bit, but uh, we're, the three of us are, what I would say, pains in the A's. <laughs> we don't let up. We don't let up. I mean, we converse with each other every week and say, when do you want to meet? So well, I can't this week, how about next Tuesday? Okay, let's meet next Tuesday. And we sit out, we look at each other and say, okay, where are we at? What have we done? You check on your city manager, blah, 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 right down the line. And so we're always on the forefront of what would do different? Maybe before the Fidelity Group existed, maybe back then, if you want to turn back the clock, if we should have started this earlier, understanding that this is being created into a massive problem. So we probably should have had things like this that we could have learned more about, you know, the homeless. So we're working it. I think we're doing fine. And again, I, if I can't reinforce, this is an example of what finding those common threads of, of overcoming differences can do. I mean, we know we live in an age of extreme polarization, everyone going to their extreme corner uh, of the spectrum that they possibly can. Yeah, all three of us are nonpartisan, but don't think for a second that we don't fall into the corner. We know this is state election, right? I, Bob and I always laugh is where we sign and put on our lawn. Paul cancels it. Um, <laughs> but but I mean, we couldn't we couldn't be tighter with the respect factor of that we we are here. We truly respect each other. We built the partnership. We built the friendship, and we're going. To
to work together to get things done. And we're going to have laughs in, in, in between, right? I'm going, Bob and I, right? Bob's also. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Right? It, but that's, that's where you can get to when you, when you find that common base of overcoming those differences. Right? Overcoming those differences and saying we all have something in common. And that's not only that do we truly care about the respect of our own, of the success of our own city as mayors, but, but I know every time Dover succeeds and Rochester succeeds, some of us succeeds. And, and Paul and Bob truly believe in the same, is that we benefit because, especially some of us, we're, we're right in the middle of these two giants, literally. We're the smallest city in New Hampshire, 10 square miles, and we are just outmassed by these two giants on the side, right? You can't get to Dover unless you drive through some of us. You can't get to Rochester unless you drive through some of <laughs> right? So some of us is in the middle, and it just made sense for all three of us to, to strengthen that partnership because every time there's a score up on the board, there's a score for all three of us. Just, just quickly, Todd, and I think the, the strong relationship that we have built and spread through our communities. Is there anybody from Waypoint here? Anybody? Yeah, okay, good, I see a few hands. Of course there is. All right, good. <laughs> hey, Waypoint just opened up a, a resource center in Rochester last night and it was the open house. It had to be about 200 people. Tremendous support for the community. So I think the community, so the community sees, sees it, sees our work. Thanks so much. Uh, same question for Manchester. What would you do differently? Uh, what would you do again? Differently? What would you do again? If anything.
I, I sense a theme. I sense the theme of working together. Right, the importance of working together. Um, and what a great example of the time to plan for winter for winter housing is when it's 85 degrees, not 45 degrees. Um, so I appreciate that. Now, with who we have for panelists and who we have for a moderator, I knew we would really run up to the brink of our time. Um, we do have on here uh, questions from the audience. So we do have you know, just a, two or three more minutes left. Do we have any questions from the audience? That was quick, thank you. Go right ahead. Do you want me to bring No, you can't move it. No, you can't move it. No, that has to stay. Everything is kind of at a, at a stall right now with 
when some things until the dust settles. Um, so when the dust settles, we'll see what the new direction is. Uh, but in the interim, the county county commissioners continue to work on funding sources. Um, have applied for have applied for some of the state funding um, as well. Got denied round one. We're automatically into round two. So we'll see what we're able to capture on round two. And we'll see what the palette of the county delegation is. Right now, uh, our role was to develop what we believe was a long-term sustainable plan um, of, of something that is affordable and, and something that will solve a problem the county can lead on. Uh, and not for, you know, it, and, and some of, I'll give some of the negative pushback. Some of the negative pushback was from the surrounding towns within Stratford County saying that they didn't have a voice and that the cities have led. This is a prime example of how the surrounding towns can now be part of this because uh, what, who has led is all three cities. The shelter is in Summersworth, and we don't deny anyone is that we have residents during the warming center from all of the towns in Stratford County. So in our opinion, we've developed a plan now where it is a full county um, moving forward together supporting each other. Uh, because the way, that we're not going, the way that we are not going to solve homelessness in Stratford County is by Dover, Summersworth, and Rochester only coming up with the solution and only offering the services. Uh, we came up with a model of how the three cities in, in Stratford County can truly work together and, and move in the same direction. And we are hoping that model now by utilizing the county and working with the county delegation, the county commissioners, can now spread to all of Stratford County. And we know the only line between Stratford County and Rockingham is the bridge, right? So I refer to our mayoral, mayoral colleague that we also, that we like giving a lot of a lot of game here and there, our mayor over in Portsmouth, is that we're the other side of the bridge, as we said. So, you know, Tover, Rochester, and some of the, we're the other side of the bridge from Portsmouth. But that, that line means nothing, as we know, when it comes to addiction, when, when it comes to crises, when it comes to homelessness. Those lines mean nothing. We're all in this together. And the sooner we can build those models of all going in the same direction together and erase those superficial boundaries and lines that polarize us, the further we're going to get ahead. Again, this crazy thing called civility and communication. Try it sometime. It really works. <laughs> the only the only thing I'll add is that uh, <laughs> you take a, a look at Riverside Rest Home and those people in Riverside Rest Home. They're good people that worked hard all their life. Eighty percent of those people uh, have Alzheimer's. So this new facility that we're pushing to try to have built will take those people and give them a decent way of life, a brand new facility. And in that transition, the existing Riverside Rest Home can be a transitional housing for the homeless, up to 200 beds. So we also are looking at the model of crossroads in Portsmouth. We parallel our thoughts. They're successful. They have 125 beds. It works. It moves. It, it's good. But, you know, some of the delegation, the governor, it would be nice to have them take a tour of Riverside Restaurant. And if they took a tour and they saw that facility and know and take a real hard look at our plan, I would believe that they would scratch their head and say, how come we waited so long? And that's what we're after here. That we're talking to our state reps, the delegation, all of the above, because we're kind of at a roadblock in some ways, you know? I thought Governor Sununa would be here with a checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had another one. <laughs> yeah, we believe we have a good plan and it's workable. We also believe that, you know, four residents to one bathroom is unacceptable, and 35 residents to one tub is also unacceptable. Thank you, Mayor. I will say that if it can be done, I know that we, these three mayors will do it. And I'm not just saying that because Dan is my lifelong friend. I'm not just saying that because Mayor Count Dan is the mayor of Rochester. And I'm not just saying that because uh, Mayor Carey is a great guy. He pays for coffee. How many times do I have to do I'd like to wrap this up. I'd like to wrap this up by just saying um, that I've worked about 25 years in social services. Um, and I've also been to the counselor, school board. Um, I've worked with Dana, Mayor Hilliard, um, on the city council. Right? Um, I recognize that there could be a version among 
response, my social service piece, they got me messed. And there are reasons. But we can also work together. We can work together. And the mayors know that we can be in a version, but they're here anyway. They're here anyway. They're here in our house. And earlier, their carrier stated, we should have him keep the wishes the one regret, for lack of better words, was that he wishes he had more functions, more opportunities like this. So I think you have influenced us, and I'm hoping that we have influenced you as well um, with shared knowledge.